additional skill acquisition program international webinar series being organized by the uh, Kochi Asati. We have we are discussing a very important topic today, which is uh, uh, pertaining to the oil and gas industry. So uh, we we all know that uh, the world is uh, facing the largest crisis after World War II, and there are people saying that this is World War III itself. The only difference is that all the world is united against an invisible uh, enemy, which is a virus, tiny virus, and uh, the whole world is uh, going through one of the greatest crises and. Uh, the global economy is uh, still falling even when we are uh, discussing this uh, the oil price has fallen to all time low and uh, with the transportation sector especially the aviation sector uh, which is almost halted the industry is quite clueless as to how uh, the post covid world will be behaving and uh, yesterday in one of the uh, discussions a similar discussion a person from uk was telling me that uh, the virus is not here on a tourist visa it is here on a permanent visa and we may have to live with the virus for a very long time so this uh, brings sums up the whole situation in front of us today we are very fortunate to have a galaxy of experts people with more than 30 years of experience uh, in the oil and gas industry, people who have known the pulse of production, the pulse of uh, uh, business as far as the oil field is concerned. Uh, and uh, let me now introduce the panel before you. We have with us uh, today Dr. P. Sojan Lal, who is the principal of Mar Baselius Institute of Technology and Sciences, Kodamangalam in Kochi. He is having more than 30 years' experience both in Middle East and in India. He has been a leading academic uh, in Kerala since a long time. He has to his credit uh, several publications, including journal papers, conference papers, and uh, he is a research guide as well. Started with his MTech in engineering, uh, mechanical engineering to be very precise. He did his uh, doctoral degree in computer science. And then he even went to the uh, UK for his management degree. And uh, from where he went to the US for his doctoral degree in business administration. A person who is uh, well versed with enterprise assessment management as well as business planning. A very good morning to you, sir. Uh, we expect to hear a lot from you. We have also in the panel uh, uh, Sri Matthew Chako who is a mechanical engineering graduate from the government engineering college Trichur. He also has more than 30 years experience working in the Middle East in the field of oil and gas. He's a person who is having considerable expertise in uh, asset integrity management and uh, he is currently serving in the UAE. Very good morning and welcome to you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kurula Philip is uh, an instrumentation engineer with uh, more than 34 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. He, he worked for 12 years in one of the premier institutions concerning oil exploration in India, that is the Oil and Natural Gas Commission. I, I, I hope he will bring all those experience to this panel discussion. And he also served for more than 22 years in the Middle East. And his uh, fields are safety, implementation, and production. And we have a very experienced speaker, a Toastmaster in today's panel. He is none other than Mr. Radha Krishna PS. Uh, he is a mechanical engineering graduate with more than 30 years of experience in this industry. And yes, he is, uh, his last eight years experience is in gas production in URI. So uh, as you all know, it is a, uh, I feel like looking at the night sky with a lot of stars, uh, it is a, a clear, clear uh, skies, you know, giving a good view of the oil oil field also. So uh, very good morning to everyone. Once again, I would request all the uh, attendees who have come to participate, uh, listen to this presentation to be patient uh, to uh, through the presentation and you'll get an opportunity 
to post your questions through the Q&A option available in, in the dashboard. So after all the presentations and panel discussions are over, so we'll be taking your questions one by one and the panel will be addressing. So with that short, in, short introduction, let me now hand over to Dr. P. Sojan Lal, uh, who is the lead speaker for today. Over to you, Sojan, sir. Uh, good morning to all of you. Thank you, Dr. J. Giren, sir, Head of Training and Curriculum Development, for giving a, a good introduction about us. And also, we'd like to thank the ASAP team for welcoming us to this program. And particularly, our special thank to Mr. Ashish Francis, who is keen and uh, interacting with us for developing this program. And also, Ms. Neetu Satin and also Dr. Veena N. Madhavan, CEO of ASAP. Once again, good morning to all the participants, students, faculty members, and practicing engineers. As we have seen in this uh, picture, crude oil industry, what is the future of this? That is, we are going to discuss. And as you have seen the trend graph, the oil and industry had lots of ups and downs particularly you have seen the price of oil has gone up and down so at the end of this program we will come and we will be able to describe you how each and every time the oil and gas industry has come up next slide please and during our today's program we will go in through the various topics the supply chain of oil and gas industries starting with the exploration and we will be dealing with drilling processing of crude oil as well as gas and the internal and external transportation within the industry and to the external to the industry and also we will be giving a glance of oil and gas facilities. Over and above, I am sure that all the students and the junior faculty members particularly looking forward what will be the future of oil and gas industry. And we will be describing to you the graduate engineer positions in detail. And also in the next slide, we will describe to you various technical positions, particularly for diploma and IT holders as well as there is a number of certification programs are existing and by which also you'll be able to come and see this and also at the end of the program we'll be showing you three different tires of industry tire one tire two and tire three by in which even the freshers how you'll be able to get into the industry and slowly and finally at the later career positions you will be reaching to the tire one type of industries and also at the end of this program we will be telling about the upskilling and reskilling opportunities and certifications and ending with the question and answer sections next slide please so hi here we see that <coughs> oil supply chain in a broader sense and each of the components if you look into this that itself is a huge industry starting with the exploration and production from either from the onshore or the offshore facilities transportation through the ship or through the pipeline and bringing the crude oil to a refinery and you said you know that in the refinery we are making lots of products like petrol, diesel, kerosene, and so on and so on. And mostly the products will be delivered primarily through the road to the consumers, including LPGs. Now, in the next slide, you will be seeing about the gas production overview, which I'll be handing over to Mr. Philip for explaining further. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sojan. Now, uh, good morning, all. 
uh, I will now try to take you through the gas supply chain, which is very similar to the oil supply chain that was explained in the earlier slide. Now, gas is found in reserve, reservoir fields uh, below the earth and uh, across, across the world in many, many, many countries. So uh, primarily, this is available in the Middle East, in Africa. Uh, we also have it in Iran, Russia, the former Soviet Union. You can find gas also in Australia, uh, and, and, and especially in India, also in Bombay offshore, we do have gas, sour gas. Uh, it comes out of a field called the South Basin field uh, off the coast of Bombay. So gas is uh, normally produced, and the wells uh, are sometimes offshore. Most of the times they are offshore, but there are also land, land uh, pro production wells also. And they are transported through pipes to a separation vessel where you will knock out the heavier parts of the hydrocarbon. So gas is nothing but uh, lighter hydrocarbons compared to oil, which is uh, normally having heavier hydrocarbons. So even the non-associated gas will have some condensate associated with the liquid form, which will be taken out using gravity separation. And the remaining gas comes into a gas treatment uh, facility after which it is transported by pipeline to a liquefaction plant. Now, in the liquefaction plant, we use a cryogenic process, basically. We will use fractional distillation, uh, which means maintaining temperatures at different levels, low temperatures, and we start knocking out uh, certain gases like LPG. Uh, this is uh, gas that those are like propane and butane, which are heavier hydrocarbons compared to the natural gas, which is normally methane with a mixture of little bit trace of ethane. Now, if you have to uh, liquefy methane and ethane, you have to take it to very low temperatures, as low as minus 140 degrees, where you will start seeing uh, the, the, the lighter hydrocarbon separating out. And this is essentially done by running them through a series of aluminum tube coils and uh, exposing them to compressed refrigerant gases. And uh, once it is uh, reaching a temperature of minus 162, the gas will, natural gas will liquefy, and it is called LNG, which will be stored in LNG insulated tanks on shore. Now, LNG normally, because it is uh, having most of these countries who produce LNG have surplus LNG, they export it, uh, including the Middle East is a large exporter, and also in Africa. Uh, this, so what happens is across the sea, this is transported in container ships, LNG container ships. And what you can see here is the loading bay. And these are shipped to the countries that are, uh, are the customers. The consumers take the LNG. And then, then again, the process is actually reversed, where you would regasify re using heat exchangers. You would regasify. And then the gas is transmitted and distributed to the end user. Now, where do you use LNG? Uh, the gas can uh, be, after once it is regasified, it is sent to power, power plants using the gas trunk pipeline. In India, we have the, in Baruch, we do have, uh, we have a, a terminal from where Gas Authority of India has got a pipeline crossing five states. And the end users can be power stations, fertilizer industry. In other countries, they also use it for, even for the food industry, the paper industry. And uh, in very cold climates, uh, it is also used in domestic uh, buildings for heating of the houses. So that gives you, uh, a, a, this is a, just a bird's eye view of the gas supply chain. And you have up to from here to here, up to the liquefaction plant, it is called upstream facility. And then downstream, you have all the liquefaction, transportation, and marketing. Let's go to the next slide. Now, it all starts with production. And so how do you? Produce, yes, that will be our next slide. So here, what you see is a typical drilling rig because these gas reserves can be found way below down in the earth. So you have to bore holes into the earth to get to those reservoirs. The gas and oil is normally trapped in a formation, a rock formation called cap rock. And you have to drill down thousands of feet sometimes to get to this. So. There are various types of drilling rigs. I'm showing you a typical drilling rig or drilling derrick, 
and uh, the rigs can be heavy duty light duty some of them drill up to 2000 to 3000 feet and others can drill all the way up to 25000 feet up to 7 kilometers uh, down into the earth to reach the reservoir where you find the hydrocarbons now as you can see down below we have the drill bit which is connected to uh, the drill pipe and the drill pipe actually is a narrow pipe sitting within a wider pipe called the, the casing pipe which is cemented to the uh, walls of the hole the drill hole as you come up the entire assembly is connected to uh, this red structure which is the blowout prevention equipment in case uh, the drill bit encounters a high pressure zone there could be high pressure hydrocarbons rushing out and to and to control it uh, if to and to prevent an incident or a blowout you have blowout prevention equipment here which is a safety equipment above that you have a pipe piece of pipe called the kelly which actually holds up the entire drill string which is consisting of drill pipes and the drill bit uh, the difference of the kelly pipe from the normal drill pipe is that it is a uh, cross section is actually square or sometimes hexagonal and it is connected to the drill floor through bushings and there is a rotary table here through which you can actually rotate the entire drill string so to rotate the rotary table you have a rotary drive here now the whole thing is suspended the kelly is actually connected to a swivel which allows you to do rotary move rotary movement and then it is also connected to what is called a traveling block up into the crown block then which actually is connected to what is called the draw works so you can basically uh, lower the drill as it as it drills down into the earth also you can see a flexible pipe here which is the kelly pipe and then you have the stand pipe the stand pipe is connected to the mud pump now mud pump contains drilling fluids these, these drilling fluids have got a lot of uh, benefits it actually is used to remove the cuttings when they come down it is pumped down into the drill pipe comes out through the casing in between the annulus between the drill pipe and the casing and it comes out here and then it is also brought back into a shale shaker screen where it is again recirculated now the cuttings are analyzed and then the driller can know uh, what is the type of cutting or rock formation he's drilling through and i will explain that in the next slide the other thing to remember is that the entire assembly is called is connected to a four leg structure this red thing that you see here it is called the drilling derrick so the drilling derrick holds the entire structure uh, entire uh, assembly uh, is suspended from the drilling derrick from the top of the drilling derrick uh, we will come to the next slide and there are of course engines here to drive these draw works and uh, there are different types of rigs uh, you have on the land you have land rigs but offshore the te technology is different you have jackup rigs you have semi submersible rigs submersible rigs and also uh, we have drill ships which can uh, go around drilling of course now let us look at the types of drilling that, that are uh, normally prevalent in in the world until the 1920s the, we only had vertical drilling but then later on in the 1920s they started using intermittently they started using horizontal drilling and it became commercially viable by the 1980s so as you can see vertical drilling is using drilling down into the into the cap rock uh, and into the reservoir straight down thousands of feet whereas in the case of horizontal drilling uh, after a thousand feet or so the drill bit will be uh, changed and then they use a directional drill bit and the direction of the pipe changes and goes uh, goes actually horizontally and it can actually access a point which is thousands of feet away from the location of the drilling rig now the advantage of this is that you could have offshore a stationary jackup rig and then you can drill multiple or multiple wells from the same location so one of the wells will be vertical and the remaining wells will be drilled horizontally into different parts and you can tap from different points of the reservoir and bring up the uh, oil the hydrocarbons to a common platform so that's a very brief uh, overview of how drilling is done uh, for hydrocarbons or in the oil and gas industry. 
and I will pass this. Uh, I'll pass the next slides will be uh, passed on to Mr. Matthew, who will explain to you basic processing. Thank you, Philip. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, now let us see what is the, uh, the simple process which is going on in an oil industry. You know, as Mr. Philip uh, explained, there will be wells uh, drilled and get ready for uh, production. These wells are normally a natural flowing wells, and some of the wells are driven by ESP electrical submersible pump, and some of them will be gas lift facilities. The whole well is connected to a manifold, and it is then uh, this manifold is fed the feed into a separator. You know, there is a series of pressure vessels and tanks you can see there. The first step, this production fluid will be fed into the separator where fresh water is pumped into it. Uh, it is acting as a wash water. A little bit of chemical is also injected to the first size separator. The pressure of the well, uh, well head is normally 400-450 PSI and it is being reduced to 200-250 here in the first size separator. When the pressure reduces, the water and gas will be separated automatically. So the gas will be taken to the gas processing plant. You can see the yellow lines. And the oil will be passed on to the next stage separator, the second stage separator. The water separated will be collected in a produced water tank. It is um, then finally re-injected to the reservoir back for uh, increasing the pressure of the reservoir itself. When the oil is passed on to the second stage separator, it will further reduce the pressure. When the second stage, second stage separation will be taken place, when the pressure is coming down to somewhere around 40 to 50 psi. So here, the most of the say around say 80 to 90 percent um, separation is all, almost taken in place. Some of the crude is having high emulsion, and it needs some more treatment. So in that type of crude, will be fed into a as pressure vessel called a heater treater, where the crude will be heated to certain temperature somewhere around 60 to 70 degrees centigrade. And by the help of an electrical grid located in the top, you can see the total lines. The further uh, separation will be taken place in the heater treater. Then, after the heater treater, the crude will be then passing to the desalter and dehydrator. Where the desalter is mostly the same like a heater treater without a heating element. And the dehydrator is basically acting as a settling tank. Settling tank and it separates the water from there. So at this stage, mostly all the gases, almost all the gases will be separated, water is separated, and we are getting a, a, a dry crude there. Then there will be some residual gases. These gases will be removed. By by a gas boat, which is a vertical column, and after removing this gas, then it will be going to the settling tank. This settling tank will absorb all the sediments, sand, all the dirt coming from the reservoir, and the clear crude will be pumped to the shipping terminal tank farms. So here, uh, you can see the all the yellow lines are the gas lines. The black one is the water, and the yellow one, I'm sorry, the green one is the crude uh, flowing path. So, when this hydrocarbon, when we drill from the, uh, uh, when we get from the well uh, reservoir, it is having a lot of uh, water, salt, sand, sediment, and sort of things. The whole, whole thing will be removed. And we have to ship the crude with a specification which is fit for feeding into the refinery. So let us go to the next slide so that we can see some of the real pictures of the uh, equipments. You know, when we come to the well, uh, you know, after drilling, um, uh, the rig is moved. A cluster of well is fitted at the top of the uh, well. So it is called the Christmas tree. It is also called the well head. This, this cluster of valve is controlling the flow of the fluid as well as the pressure of the fluid. Then these CA series, a cluster of these wells are being connected together through the flow lines, pipelines, and it is being fed into the plant. 
So the oil processing plant at the bottom of the slide is a, is a three train plant, which is having the same three systems which we have seen in the previous slide. So the operations from the well up to the terminal, shipping terminal is being monitored, controlled uh, by a control room. It is being connected with instrumentations and uh, control systems. The next slide we will explain how all these equipments are uh, located in an offshore platform. In the one store, it is very, uh, very easy to install and construct and operate. But when you go to the offshore, it is very, very tough task to uh, arrange all these things in, in, in the locations. So the, you can see the uh, platform, which is having all these separators, heat exchangers, heat, uh, I mean, heater, treater, tanks, everything, except tank, it will be there. So as you know, you know, for the oil uh, main process facility, we need a lot of uh, water for um, washing the crude and also for the domestic use of uh, the people working around it. So normally we will have a water treatment plant this uh, blue four vertical tank um, slide will show you an overview of a water treatment plant, which is having a capacity of somewhere around 30,000 barrels per day. So when we consider the whole operation uh, process, there is a lot of electrical um, equipments are connected to drive the pumps, compressors, and instrumentation things, injection pumps, and so on. So there is a heavy demand of electrical power in the station. Since we are at the remote place, getting power from the uh, from the remote area is very difficult. So almost all the plant, or almost all the operation facilities having a power plant. Normally, a one million uh, production um, facility is need a hundred MBA connected load. Normally, it happens. So there will be a huge power plant which is catering all the electrical needs of the processing facility. Now, as I told you, you know, this uh, crude oil, when, we, when it is coming from the reservoir, it carries mainly uh, water, crude, as well as gas. Then the whole fluid is flammable. You know, the gas is containing high, highly poisonous H2S also. So, the hazard associated with the oil field operation is comparatively higher than the higher other industries. So we have to take all the precautions to safeguard our people, equipments, and the, and the environment. So these are some of the equipment which is we are using as a PPE and the equipments to protect from uh, our to, uh, protect from the safety hazards. It includes even fire trucks and other sort of things are there, which is not shown here. Let us go to the next slide. It will show you a compressor station. It's a huge, huge, massive plant there. The compressor is mainly using to, uh, to compress the gas and either to ship to the gas processing plant or we are re-injecting to the reservoir to build up the pressure. So these, com these compressors are either driven by gas turbine as one well below, or it will be uh, driven by uh, motor, electric motors. So these are all huge equipments and very sophisticated equipment which we are using in the oil field, which requires very highly technical uh, person to, to maintain and handle the things. Another thing is <coughs> automation. Everything is progressing um, towards automation at the moment. So automation is also implemented in, in oil sector at the moment. So from the from the well up to the shipping terminal, the hunter process can be monitored and it can be controlled from a central control room as we see in the, uh, in the previous slide. So this is a simple automation sketch we have shown in the bottom of the slide. Even our fleet operations, you know, the crude tankers and the product tankers are also connected to this system. So that the movement of the tanker will be monitored from the control room. And we, we come to know that what time it will be reaching to the destination and we can plan 
uh, the offloading as well as uh, all the tasks at the terminal will be pre-planned. So the automation is also require a lot of skillful people and, um, and technicians. Let us transfer to the next slide. This is the area which we are all interested at the moment. You know, as Dr. Sajan said, there will be there are ups and downs in the oil industry. But still, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, projects that are ongoing. Moreover, all the companies are increasing their production capacity, and there are people working in the research of simplifying the process, getting how to get the new uh, reservoir uh, locations, or I mean seismic surveys. So a lot of research work is ongoing in this industry to, to simplify the process and to more economic uh, production. So there is a big department in major oil companies for the research and development with, and working with a team of engineers for the research and development. So the next thing is, you know, when we are talking about a plant, it needs to be get designed to, to suit the requirement of the uh, Cool quality. So there are a pool of the design engineers who is working together to con how to uh, to design a uh, to design a plant, and there are ample opportunities in this particular area. So, so that is the next next process is once the design is completed, then we need to contract out the entire project. So, uh, preparing the scope of work. Uh, inviting tenders, technical evaluations, arbitrations, and a lot of things will be carried out within the contract department until the award of the contract. So, a panel of engineers is working together to put all these documents together to, uh, until the award of the contract. The, the opportunities in that area is also enormous. Once the contract is awarded, it is handed over to the project department. Project is, is a, it is something like, a, a, it's a massive construction is going on. And people from various disciplines, mechanical, electrical, civil, instrumentation, IT, all people are working in the project together. In mostly from the project manager, project engineer, and so on. So there is a pool of employment chances there in the project. The detailed project will be explained in later stage. Once the construction is started, then we have to look after the quality of the work, especially, you know, as you know, all the equipments are mainly uh, constructed by carbon steels. It is welded together and in, in uh, foundations. So welding is taken place, hydro test is going on, and similar to uh, all activities at the site needs to be controlled by a quality assurance and quality control team. A big team of engineers are working in that sector also. So now we are about to complete the construction of the plan. But meantime, in parallel, the drilling of the well is already been taken place in parallel with that. Building, as Mr. Mr. Um, Philip said, you know, each well is taking two to three months to drill. After the three, three months, the well will be ready and it will be connected to the uh, production uh, facilities. So, in order to have an optimum drilling, there is a team of drilling engineers are working in various drilling platforms. So, opportunities in the drilling area is enormous because they are working around the clock and the, it is a very costly affair. So, the time is money. So, drill time is to be get ready. So well experienced and skillful people are working in that platform. Now, once again, as we said, the all the hydrocarbons, everything is very uh, flammable as well as it is um, highly poisonous. So each and every activity has to be taken care of uh, very carefully. We have to find out what is the hazard behind each and every act activity, even. Uh, welding or operations or maintenance. So for that, all the job, whenever it is going for uh, uh, starting, before starting the job, 
when hsc engineers are visiting the site and, and find out the hazard and put barriers to prevent any hazard in the site so each and every places a team this uh, presence of an hsc engineer is mandatory so a pool of engineers are working in all the oil industries now we have the uh, uh, wells ready and it is hooked up to the plant and it start working on it however the well is also having uh, you know the change in uh, change in the production fluid characteristics you know when the well initially starting it will be producing only oil after some time it will be added with water and so on so the well is also requires some sort of a maintenance like other equipments so this sort of maintenance is not visible from the from the floor uh, from the floor so it is done underground with the help of uh, some regulars at the operations so some specialized engineering people are required to do all this maintenance job there is a very huge requirement of production engineering uh, for production engineers in in the future uh, in industry now as you know this whole uh, equipment is being scattered within say 22 80 kilometers wells plants and and all sort of things so in order to communicate between the people between the production facility between the equipment there are a communication system is established so in order to run and facilitate the service of the telecommunication system the pool of engineers are working in that sector also the next thing is instrumentation you know the, it's all as you said as you seen the it is all four flow and pressure controls you know between stages of the separator uh, heat exchanger everywhere pressure temperature and the flow rates are more important so it's all controlled by certain instrument networks so this network is been um, looking after by a set of engineers called instrument control engineers now as i said there will be a changes of the production fluid takes place during the operating period of time so one plant is somewhere designed for 0 to 50 to years some of them will be going up to 60 even 70 years of time so during this period the the behavior of the well all the fluid coming from the well is keep on changing so if there is a process engineering team who is looking closely monitoring the change in the process and advising the field operations for the changes and modifications this is a very high skillful job a lot of engineers are working in 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 this uh, sector now the next one is the maintenance engineer maintenance means you know once uh, as, as you know this once anything is been uh, newly constructed and it it require periodic maintenance during the life cycle period for example any equipment motor pumps and uh, uh, static equipment like pressure vessels uh, piping everything required a periodic maintenance you know this maintenance is being carried out by um, specialized engineers in, in the particular discipline for example all the mechanical maintenance job will be done by mechanical engineers electrical and electrical discipline and so on so maintenance is the very important um, area of the oil industry because it gives the it, it will give ensure the extended lifetime for the entire plant and another thing is the next is the corrosion and inspection engineer it is something like an asset integrity department asset integrity department means there is there, there is a pool of engineers looking after the uh, uh, the defect mechanism what are the defects can happen within the plant like material loss like related to corrosion cracks and these people are monitoring the metal loss and inspecting periodically on stream and off stream inspections are carried out and ensure that the plant is fit for purpose for the desired life of uh, um intended life of uh, i mean intended period of life so this is lot of people like corrosion engineers inspection engineers tank inspectors pressure vessel inspectors pressure safety valve inspectors are working in this particular school of engineering 
so we have seen a lot of activities are happening in the field so there should be a planning for the entire thing you know we need to plan how much oil needs to be produced and when it needs to be produced and where it needs to be dispatched so the whole business part of this industry is being done by a, a, a tool of uh, planning engineers they are basically called the business planning group and the maintenance of each equipment is being carried uh, planned and carried out by the help of uh, computerized uh, maintenance management system like maximo sap and such things by the maintenance planning engineers so the whole planning team is controlling the entire task in the, in the field yeah the next one is the materials you know we as you know we are we are talking about a lot of activities having engineering materials the procurement storing and supply and on time will be is a massive job which is handled by a material logistic team uh, material logistic team you know when we talk about the business everything is counting on the unit cost so cost per per barrel is the most important aspect in the oil industry so all activities happening in the field will be analyzed by a costing and optimization engineering tool for further um, optimization to reduce the cost per barrel so in addition to all these things you know we are running on on a zero paper uh, documentation system in oil field everything is computerized all the data from the uh, down hole i mean the reservoir up to the terminal including production data hr data finance everything is being kept in our computerized system where a security team is working to safeguard our data and system analyst and network engineers are providing the support service to the entire uh, employees of the company so this is the engineer level uh, job is there similar to that we have a next level job which is given in the same uh, same pattern there will be assistant supporting to the research and development team there the draftsman will be supporting the uh, design people, design engineers contract assistants will be working along with the contract engineers of course in the project there will be project supervisors and, uh, and the support uh, supporting people for the project engineers and project managers like our qqc inspector will be doing the exact work at site the inspections will be carried out by those people normally ndt people are working there ut rt and pt certified people when come to this drilling side a lot of people are working as a drilling assistant in various sector to support the drilling supervisor as the drilling engineer you know the uh, safety department is it is having its own watch eyes and ears uh, where the job is going on so inspectors are walking around the, all the work work site and and safeguard the work uh, ensure that the working place is safe so it needs a lot of inspectors there and in order to support the production engineers at well site we have production foreman then of course there will be telecom technician to assist the uh, our telecom engineers for the to look after the telecom network now as we explained earlier the instrumentation control uh, uh, team also required Uh, technicians to uh, to do the uh, grassroots job of the system and the process operation is the main job in 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 the plant you know the whole uh, whole plant is operated by process operators this is something like a, a next level of the process engineering job so the, there are lot of opportunities because number of people the, are more in the pro, uh, production operations then maintenance technicians are available skillful technicians in the sector of mechanical electrical civil every every discipline is required to to supervise the things as well as to do the practical job at the site corrosion foreman coating inspector and and ndt inspectors are the part of the integrity team with the corrosion inspection engineers of course planning assistant l a ban pool of planning assistants are working Um, and we are supporting our planning engineers for business as well as maintenance uh, planning activities material logistics foreman they, these people are um, receiving the material uh, maintaining the stock and issuing the material on time 
as we explained you know the our cyber security and network is required a, a secondary level of people to support under the entire task so these are the a sector we are having a ample opportunities even though it is a block in a each block containing number of hundreds each field is having say, say five to 20 people are working in each blocks so you can imagine the massive number of people working in in an industry a one one uh, one million barrel of oil producing company is having somewhere around 800 to say 1000 people are working at that site so this is uh, the basic things job opportunities here let me pass on the floor to mr radha krishnan for the further uh, discussion thank you gentlemen thank you very much uh, thank you, Matthew Chako. I'm very happy you included the word ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to all of you. As uh, Chako said, ladies and gentlemen, in current uh, oil field, ladies are also getting a lot of uh, opportunities. And in Middle East, uh, the ladies are being preferred uh, to be raised at higher ranks like CEO level. So it's a good opportunity for ladies as well. Yeah, so we'll go into the slide. So we are seeing uh, engineering opportunities divided into three levels. The level one is specifically for 10 years and above experience, and it is mostly catering to the uh, end client, okay, where these uh, oil companies are actually producing the oil and gas. So in the upstream and downstream oil and gas petrochemical industry, if you see in the first row, uh, you have companies like Aramco from Saudi, Adnoc from Abu Dhabi, a PDO from uh, Oman, a Shell, Total, BP, Exxon, or across the world. Uh, we have ONGC from India. We have QP from uh, Qatar. Uh, KOC is from Kuwait. Petronas from Malaysia. And uh, Gale, IOC, and CRL all from India. So that's the top tire of the upstream and downstream. But there is another tire where you have the project engineering companies who mainly uh, do the major uh, project activity which are the EPC and the BOT, that is uh, uh, build, operate, and, uh, operate, and uh, uh, transfer, and the PMC, which is a consulting firms. So some of the companies here are uh, Petrofac, NPCC, TR, uh, Stamp Project T, LNT, EIL, Cypem, Equate, Technip, Dotsel, Unjloid, uh, Jacob Engineering, uh, Bechtel, and KBR. The, the last but not the least, because as uh, uh, Matthew has showing you facilities of uh, power generation and water, uh, power generation, distribution, and water are also a part of oil and gas field to a large extent. So NTPC, uh, Advia, Diva, ACWA, Karama, and ADDC, these are a few examples of uh, uh, these, stuff, these type of power generation companies across the Middle East. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So the level two, we saw the level one. The level two caters to experiences of five years and above. So uh, people here would look at, at sectors like oil well drilling, plant maintenance, rotating and static equipment, instrumentation, uh, control, uh, painting and uh, coating, and power generation. Some of the companies that are uh, very premier in this uh, field are uh, Alliburton, Schlumberger, Baker, GE, Snyder, FMC, Honeywell, Yokogawa, ABB, Rosemont, Fisher, Weir, Reda, Central Lift, Cobra, and Weatherford. Uh, we have seen the two uh, levels. The third level is for the uh, new entrants, the fresh graduates, and even one or two years of experience. And all these three levels, if you observe, they have uh, the requirement of uh, support services like finance, admin, HR, and logistics. In each of the area, you require these disciplines also along with the engineering disciplines. Here in the level three, if you see the sectors covered here are plant modifications that happen inside the green field, tie-ins, which happens across the pipeline, site constructions, which happens on a small scale along with the EPC, inspection and testing uh, services, which are uh, provided across for all the areas of uh, activity, scaffolding, lifting uh, are also required for uh, uh, most of the areas where you have huge equipments and huge uh, material being handled. 
of course planning and logistics is always part of any uh, industry any activity in oil and gas because that is key to having a proper uh, setup in place some of the companies here would be robstone sari engineering dnv gl bvqi sts burley parson floor engineering mcdermott gulfar ccc nafco drager trico tecton and alasa we move to the next slide and uh, we have seen that you are all in basic qualification of engineers who are a uh, new entrants or uh, recent pass outs you may have a challenge to get attracted by these uh, oil companies and to enhance your chances to uh, get attracted to these oil companies it is always recommended to go for a good certification process which uh, helps to put the integrity and uh, uh, safety up front and also provide the oil field with uh, people who are more hands on and then giving a raw hand to put uh, at work so we see discipline wise mechanical has a few of the upskilling process we have cad proe and cnc uh, programming that you can upgrade yourself we also have in ndt as matthew mentioned magnetic particle penetrant testing ultrasonic testing and radiographic testing and we have advanced ndt as a paut tofd and lrut okay these are all uh, further improved versions for various pipelines and other areas thermography and boroscopy also being utilized in uh, ndt field apart from these certifications in mechanical if you see there are certain uh, premier certifications from uh, across by the uh, international standards like api asmi aws cswip and asnt certifications we move to electrical electrical have caa and isolation certifications generally provided by the respective plants and we also have certain explosion uh, proof certifications like uh, ex atex and iec e, uh, ex and compex uh, this believe me this certification is very difficult to achieve but if you achieve a job will be just on your plate every moment having said uh, this we also have the nfpa which is the national fire protection uh, uh, association the uh, there is a certification from this uh, organization as well which will help in the health and hsc aspects of uh, fire fighting coming to instrumentation uh, functional safety management is a very key aspect because all the plants are basically having lot of instrumentations and lot of uh, uh, automation and these are all supporting the plants safety therefore functional safety management is a key to oil and gas field uh, dcs and field instrument certification are also provided by respective oems and henceforth uh, it is uh, good to have such certifications when you get an opportunity we also have automation certifications as cap and ccss because the similar situation of utilization of more automation in oil and gas uh, coming to civil painting and coating in civil we have st dama certification a local certification in uae which goes into the green building green building is one of the concepts nowadays followed very rigorously and keeping the environment aspect in picture it is catching up more and more we also have us building code where, where there are certain certifications can be gained by civil people now coming to painting and coating you have nais bigas cswip and frozio almost all are uh, equal in certifications and very uh, very much required in the middle east uh, when you are conducting painting inspections coming to metallurgy and corrosion we have uh, nais api 571 and we have for uh, cathodic protection cpi api pi 10 and for uh, risk based inspection we have rbi api uh, 581 all provided by uh, the american petroleum institute having said verticals of different um, uh, disciplines as you are growing into the uh, career it is it is possible that you can always go in for any alternate certification a mechanical can do a nais certification a painting inspector can do an ndt certification therefore you become multi skilled and this multi skilled will help you to go into many areas and it will also help you to grow in the organization and as you grow in the organization you need to understand all systems you don't remain in your discipline 
you become more managerial and therefore you need to have a knowledge of every discipline in the plant now we have spoken about specific certifications but there are certain common disciplines which all of the uh, uh, people can be taking uh, even engineers or even non engineers also can take these certifications like the iso uh, certifications like internal auditor and lead auditor for uh, uh, iso 9001 quality management 14001 environment management 45001 is uh, health and safety management 50001 is energy management 27001 is for um, uh, security management uh, that is information security and 22301 is for uh, uh, um, um, sustainability so these certifications are also available by uh, various ircea certified programs we are seeing quality we also see uh, project management was a key aspect so many projects has been uh, described in uh, in the previous slides so the project management certifications are like uh, pmp which is from uh, usa uh, prince certification which is from uk and agile certification and extension of pmp also from uk these are also very valid certifications and a lot of companies give a good uh, Uh, opportunity for certified people uh, since we are in the uh, optimization zone post covid there will be a lot of uh, controls required to improve the cost of the barrel therefore a lean six sigma pro, uh, uh, program is always taken up in most of the gas fields and oil fields recently and some of the certifications in lean six sigma would be white belt yellow belt green belt black belt and master and this uh, certifications are available uh, across the world and it is easy for you to access the certifications as well we move to the next slide which is talking about the future of development as uh, sojan said in the middle the oil is at dip so what's happening in the world if you see as of today 2020 250 new oil and gas projects have been uh, running and announced now in 2016 There's only 160 oil and gas projects as a comparison. So you can say how much of uh, effort is going on despite the, the current oil price, and they are focusing basically basically on FPSO vessels for storage, and around 4,000 kilometers of subsea pipeline is also underway. We have distributed our uh, list of projects across this table, if you see, and they are between uh, USA, Europe, Australia. as one area where you have from 10 to 43 billion uh, us dollar projects which is 43 billion happening in alaska while we have a uh, north africa uh, development projects where we have uh, uh, some of the uh, refineries being done here and also uh, the highest uh, value being uh, 33 billion dollars in mozambique in middle east also we have refineries and uh, uh some of the projects which are highest here is uh, kuwait which is 16 billion dollars and uh, uh, in in some other areas you have petrochemical projects also coming up and you have a lot of lng projects if you see across the table so there is a lot of work in hand it is you who need to take the uh, step forward put your finger fingers up and there is always an opportunity for you both ladies and gentlemen i hand it over back to uh, mr sojan for his final remarks Sojan, please. Uh, thank you, Radhakrishna. <coughs> thank you, Radhakrishna, for uh, giving these uh, final opportunities on this. And uh, thank you, Purvula, Philip, as well as uh, Matthew Chakko for giving the explanations. And uh, as we have seen, the lots of opportunities are coming even after the post-COVID. and uh, i think you now we'll go back to some of the questions which may arise over to dr j grand sir please so thank you so much uh, uh, the entire panel it was a highly informative uh, one hour uh, with you we felt like uh, listening to a university master lecture on a petroleum course and further opportunities in that i'll start from the last question first uh shreya has uh, said it is an excellent webinar very informative and she has one question for the panel uh, she is asking in your opinion what's the most interesting aspect of working in the oil and gas industry 
सर क्वेश्चन अगेन प्लीज इन योर ओपिनियन व्हाट इज द मोस्ट इंटरेस्टिंग एस्पेक्ट ऑफ वर्किंग इन द ऑयल एंड गैस इंडस्ट्री so then i can this question so it's it's like uh, what, what excites you most uh, while yeah, yeah. in the industry yeah yeah i understand i understood the question okay okay so they, so they are the oil and gas by the very word itself it's an exciting place uh, it, you have you have a huge field and you have huge risk so you, you you will always have have a challenge between these two so i i see that as as the, the interest in doing work here okay can i have one more uh, one more something please uh so thank you thank you so much uh, for that uh, uh, answer now two persons have asked a very important question like uh, the future era is going to be of alternate energy and alternate fuel so uh, uh, how do you think the oil and gas field will uh, react to that situation when electric vehicles and alternate fuels will be hitting the uh, energy sector uh, i'll take that question this is uh, philip here the certainly the availability of electric vehicles and alternate sources of energy are most welcome all across across the world because we know that uh, this provides us uh, with uh, definitely a much more um, environmentally friendly way of doing it but uh, if with by the word electrical the issue that we have now the challenge that the researchers are having is to make it commercially viable for example if you compare it with the oil and gas industry now this oil and gas industry uh, there are reserves currently uh, for the next 50 years at least and this is commercially viable in the sense that it is easily transportable storable we haven't yet figured out a very efficient way uh, across across the world scientists are working to find alternate sources of energy and we we need them badly but i don't think for the next 20 30 years we will be ready uh for a simple fact example is that if you're talking about electric vehicles these vehicles need to be charged and to charge you need power stations and power and this power again comes from energy which is uh, uh, which is actually generated using uh, fuels like uh, oil and gas from oil and gas thank you thank you for telling us that uh, the transition is going to take at least uh, one or two decades uh, during which the industry will be further flourishing in in even when supporting the alternate fuel development thank you sir sir there is another very important question from one shinta davis uh, the question is india is uh, newspapers tell us that india is using brent crude oil whereas USA is using WTI crude, and uh, it 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 also says that it is because of this that global crude crude oil prices that price fall is not affecting our country. We are not getting the benefits of the uh, lower prices. Uh, so, what is the difference between Brent crude oil and WTI crude oil, and why is India using Brent? Shall I take the question, please, on that? Yes, please. Yeah, this WTI crude is being. Uh, this is uh, crude is uh, generated in uh, American in US. Brent crude is it is from the British side, the European side of the uh, production. So first thing is the transportation cost will be very high from transporting from US to India. But whereas the Middle East crude as well as the Brent crude will be uh, more economical than the other one. 
so normally in india uh, i believe that we are using um, crude oil from uh, our middle east most of them are from middle east and it, we are also getting from european side so the economics is the costly is because of the transportation number one number two each and every crude has got a different qualities the light crude is giving more pro, uh, more product if you are getting more product from light crude even though it is costly it will be most economical in terms of transportation processing and and uh, uh, and distribution so when you talk about the overall economics this will be the better option that is why we are buying from here thank you oh, thank you sir uh, we will take one last question uh, because we are running short of time uh, so the question is from sachin uh, he is asking what are the skill sets that are needed for an instrumentation graduate while entering into the industry instrumentation uh, i'll take this question so uh, these for yes for first of all your basics uh, instrumentation where uh, we have instrumentation and control lock as we explained through the slides or across the entire spectrum of the oil and the gas industry one important element is instrumentation and control and uh, from my experience i feel that uh, a good knowledge of process control will help you speed up uh, your career so you could uh, take some of the if you are already a graduate you could take up uh, some of the certification courses offered by uh, ISA the international society of automation as mr radhakrishnan explained you have the cap ccst uh, certification courses there are uh, various organizations but the, the best way i would think for somebody from india would be to join one of the uh, oil and gas or if you are a fresher join one of the petrochemical fertilizer or uh, oil and gas industries and gain some experience and and the best way is to have hands on experience where you will learn uh, what the or what you see in the books you will be able to practice uh, because in the middle east as uh, was explained in the earlier slides uh, experienced uh, people if you have 5 years experience uh, in in an indian industry then your chances uh, in the job market uh, are exponentially go up i hope that answers your question okay um sir so, uh, we we have come to the end of the uh, panel discussion um it was a very uh, systematic well coordinated uh, panel presentation as uh, the distinguished panel member dr soljanlal himself uh, said in the first uh, slide about the supply chain just like oil flowing from the rig to the last end of the supply chain in the distribution network mm. ideas and uh, concepts flowed right from the first slide to the last slide uh, and the four uh, distinguished members did a wonderful job in during this one hour in 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 letting us know how the industry works in a very detailed fashion and i never knew before this presentation that the entire industry could be brought very simply like this in a one hour presentation and i sincerely wish more uh, students uh, had listened to this presentation so even while the presentation was 